paper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling, city desk, full the press, full the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. The Media Project is a half hour of commentary and analysis on what's going on in the news business and some insight into newsroom decision making with some veteran editors, and we're very grateful to have you with us. I'm Rex Smith, editor of The Upstate American, formerly editor of The Times Union, with my colleagues here. Judy Patrick, the vice president of the New York Press Association, who used to edit the Daily Gazette in Saratoga. Judy. Or in Schenectady. In Schenectady. <laughs> <laughs> we also covered Saratoga very well. I was there a reporter up there. So I there. guess they were a formidable you. competitor, and, rem- and the paper remains Back in so. the day. Uh, I well. was getting ahead of myself because that's uh, Barbara Lombardo, who was editor of the Saratogian and executive editor of the Record in Troy. There and we she did is. not reach Schenectady. <laughs> did not. No, of course. And Barbara is now teaching uh, journalism, of course, to the next generation of journalists at UAlbany. Mm, wonderful thing. And my former colleague, Mike Spain, is here, formerly associate editor of the Times Union. How about that? And a guy with a radio background, the former voice of the... I once worked in radio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will defer to you then to sound <laughs> good here. Thank you very much. We're, we have to talk about open government first and foremost here because there is actually some news about that. But just think about how much value we have derived as journalists over the years from both the Federal Freedom of Information Act and the New York State Freedom of Information Law. What do we get from that? Give us an overview. Transparency. I mean, we get to see what the government is paying its own employees, what they're spending on contracts, to whom to buy supplies. We can track information that happens at meetings that we aren't able to attend because we can get transcripts and we can get court records and we can get all kinds of useful information that we are entitled to as citizens who pay the bill. Basically, our tax money goes towards running the government. We should know how that money is being spent. But we should recognize the fact that the fight is not over. We had to fight for all of that information. The fight continues. Where average citizens and reporters throughout the state still struggle to get basic information and are denied it routinely. Right. There are big cases, like right now, There's a case pending where the Nassau Police Department, which is a a big agency, you know, about 2,500 sworn officers in Nassau County, they've been held in contempt of court for ignoring an order from a panel of appellate judges to hand over a document that it has been fighting for four years to keep secret. So, you know, this kind of thing goes on. And I think, Barbara, your experience in Saratoga is such that oftentimes you don't get the stuff that you request under the Free Information Law. Yeah, I would have to say that it varies. There were times when the city where we would most often be going to look for records would be rather accommodating and they would help us to get the information that we needed. And there were other times when the information was not forthcoming, was repeatedly denied. After I left the paper, even as a private citizen, I ended up suing the city for uh, police disciplinary records. Now, you sued. Did you have to pay a lawyer? I actually was able to get uh, pro bono help through um, the NYCLU project. But now an ordinary citizen can't do that, and and a lot of newspapers (laughs) would have a hard time paying for it. News organizations locally, the Nassau Police Department in this instance that we're talking about, has spent, what, $100,000 so far of taxpayers' money. Right, Uh, to oppose something that they've lost the case. I'm just astounded that that police agency could not only lose the case and still not provide the records. Even when the appellate division has ruled, yes, which is it's amazing. It's frightening yeah. to me. But I mean, it's kind of like an information version of that adage, you know, justice delayed is justice denied. Well, information delayed is information denied. It becomes less useful over time. It becomes something that has less relevance to today. And to just delay, 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 block, block, delay is the new tactic agencies are using. Yeah, the other thing to mention in this particular case, this is not even a request for 
disciplinary records that could be considered controversial requests. This was to get the police department's phone directory, and it was not for the personal phone information of any of the people. These were wanting to get the information for whose extension is whatever. How do you reach the people whose jobs you're paying for as a citizen. Right. right. Every newsroom has a list of sources that they share. We used to call it cop calls, to make cop calls and call different agencies. And, and when you need you know, to get some information from the controller in Troy, that's their number. If you need to get some information from the town assessor in Gilderland, New York, you can call this number. And those kinds of directories are just tools that reporters use to do the work that they do. And let's be frank, it's expensive to go to court to sue if you get denied a Freedom of Information request. And local newsrooms are strapped for revenue. They always have been, but even more so now. And if you're faced with the prospect of either letting a reporter go or spending $50,000 to challenge something in court, you're going to keep your reporter. And municipalities know that, and they call our bluff on it. So this is why this legislation that is pending now, that has passed the New York State Senate, pending in the Assembly, and then it would still need the governor's signature, could be important. This is a bill that would allow for the award of reasonable attorney fees, reasonable being determined by the courts, when a person wins a case involving request under the FOIL law. That is, if you decide that the only way to get this information is to go to court, but gee, you can't afford a lawyer, if you're pretty sure you're gonna win, you would get those fees paid. Right now, under the law, there have, there have been amendments to tighten it so that if the agency knowingly withheld, knowing that they were going to lose, irrationally or intentionally withheld, you can get those fees. But now this would be whenever you win, you would get your attorney's fees paid if you had to go to court to get it. It's such a common sense rule. My fingers are crossed that the Assembly passes this so that it can move forward. I don't understand what the holdup is in the Assembly. It, it needs to be a priority, and there's just a whole lot of things going on, and, and that was really the excuse given by Assemblyman John McDonald of Albany County, who had a chance to move it forward, and now there's a lot of people putting pressure on him to make it a priority and to open it up. It's also amazing that 50 years ago this week, a Republican governor, Malcolm Wilson, signed New York's first freedom of information law into law. And it's been around for 50 years, and it's been improved and corrected all the way along. And now there's something that is really going to remove a big roadblock to it working. And I don't understand why that's not a priority. You know, in the early days, we were a pioneer, I think, when it came to open New government York here in New York State. But from what I hear from editors around the state is the system is broken. Foils routinely do not work. Before we started taping today, we were trying to come up with, you know, examples of ways in which foil has worked for us and has produced important journalism. And all I could think of were my denials and my rejections and my failures. And it's demoralizing, especially for a young reporter. We would talk to them about the public's right to know and that the law is available to them to help them do their work and when they get rejected. And when they eventually get the information, it's like a year after they asked and the story is no longer relevant. I imagine eventually Nassau is going to get those that phone directory and, and it's all going to be outdated information. <laughs> right, of course. And tragically, the trend has been in the opposite direction. Right now in New Jersey, as a matter of fact, a bill awaiting the governor's signature veto, agencies in New Jersey will not necessarily be responsible for those fees. They have been. They've been ahead of New York in that. And that's actually pulling back. In the state of Florida, which has had some of the most aggressive sunshine laws, as these are called, over the years, under the current governor, there has been a retrenchment, and Florida is one of those places where citizen access to public information is now being pulled back. So what was happening 50 years ago is now being reversed. You know, 50 years ago was around the time of Watergate. It was a time of when people were concerned about good government, and now the trend is sort of on the side of, shall we say, authoritarianism? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's your word. <laughs> But we should just emphasize, as you said earlier, that this is not just for journalists. This is for ordinary citizens, too. People need to use this for their neighborhood organizations, yeah. Yeah. for example. I mean, you may simply want to challenge your property tax assessment, and you should be able to get that information. And usually you can, but not always. And it all depends on someone in government making it a priority. I, I'll get you that information, but I have 10 days. I'll wait 10 days to give it to you because I'm doing something else. It should be 
something that just automatically happens. Here's the book. Open it up. That happens in some municipalities when it's information like that, but it's not universal. Some make you jump through hoops and discourage you from doing exactly what you must do to get information that you're entitled to. And there's there's so much information that's on in a digital form now that it is easier for that information to be provided if the institution so chooses to provide it than it was when the FOIA laws were first enacted. Right. Which should be the next frontier, actually, in open government. That is, there should be the presumption of access. Government agencies should make documents available digitally without FOIA requests. The end documents, it should be the burden of government agencies to explain why they have to withhold documents instead of citizens having to ask for them. That is the logical next step. That is what open government advocates are calling for. But it seems as though we're not getting anywhere with that these There's days. a nonprofit organization in New York State that deals with genealogy and personal family histories, and they had sued the, I forget, whatever the department of the state is that keeps track of death records and what they were looking for, something that isn't a private thing that only the family should see. And this went back and forth and ended up being ruled in favor of the genealogy group. Mm -hmm. And the uh, state entity that didn't want to provide the records then appealed, and they, they just came up with a ruling that went three to two in favor of the state agency that they don't have to supply anything. But I'd say the dissent in that case pointed out that there were some things that could be provided and some things that you couldn't. So that, and I mention it because there's ways that the public's need to know or right to know can be satisfied and the need to protect the privacy of people can be satisfied as well by redacting certain information if it's too personal, by making sure that the request isn't overly burdensome on the entity that's being asked to supply the information. That could be a factor for uh, departments that don't have enough people or might take some time. Yeah, well, they'll claim that. They'll say that it, it takes time to go through all the information and give you what you want and we have other tasks that we're required to do. I mean, it, there's legitimacy to that. But technology should make that go away, essentially. You know, filters on databases that only reveal certain information. And technology can answer that, but it needs support from the government to yeah, do that. Yeah, there's, so. in the FOIA laws, there is an exception for people requesting things. They can be denied if they're asking for a record that doesn't exist. The institution can't be forced to create a record that doesn't exist. And that's part of the give and take in this also is, oh, you want us to sort through our digital stuff, but that record that you're asking for doesn't exist. And like, Right. On. And there, the, the exemptions, people ought to understand, there are built into the law exemptions, uh, personal privacy that might interfere with law enforcement. Those are built into the law. It's not that we believe, uh, we who advocate for open government, believe that there ought to be unfettered access to everything, but that those are prescribed in the law and they should be followed. Otherwise, documents should be made available to citizens. It's our government. After all, you know, when Kathy Hochul assumed the governorship, she promised increased transparency in state government operations. And I just haven't seen it yet. The New York Coalition for Open Government, this nonprofit based out of Buffalo, they did a study of state agencies, and their response to the FOIL request was not one that I would consider transparent. So, there we are. If you folks have any of your own experiences with this, you could share them with us, or you can share your views on this topic as you can always. Media at WAMC.org is how you intersect with the Media Project. I'm Rex Smith here with my colleagues, Judy Patrick, Barbara Lombardo, and Mike Spain. We're talking about what's going on in journalism. You know, the most interesting story nationally since our last program has been the story involving Justice Samuel Alito, the flags outside his home. This story broken by the New York Times by reporter Jody Cantor, who is one of the two reporters who uh, broke the Weinstein story on sexual harassment. Uh, Jody Cantor had the story that first was about the upside down American flag uh, a week after the insurrection at the Capitol. Then came the story about, let's say, the Christian nationalist flag that was flying outside Alito's summer home as recently as last summer. Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize that both of those flags have history. You know, an upside-down flag is a sign of distress, but it's been co-opted by the mega group as an opposition to the notion that Joe Biden had been legitimately elected president. And the same was also attached. A lot of, a lot of the Christian nationalist flags had been brought into the Capitol on January 6th and it's also an emblem of that movement. They have other history, but those are the most current 
and relevant aspects of this story. And both of those flags flew at Alito's homes. One of the questions that I think might be raised by people reading this is, why now? Why is this story appearing in the New York Times now as opposed to January of 2021 when these flags were first seen and photographed by the neighbors? What's the answer to that question? So the Washington Post was alerted to this, pursued the story, and dropped it. Did not pursue it because of the traditionally deferential treatment the media has given the Supreme Court. I think the reporter and the editors at the time said, no, not a story here. This is a neighborhood dispute. No sense in pursuing it. In retrospect, they're saying, oh, it was a different time. No, it wasn't a different time. This has always been a story. I guess we'll give the Washington Post a mulligan on this one, but it should have been covered. We give white glove treatment to the Supreme Court justices. It's one of the reasons we're in the pickle we're in right now. I think it's in part because they've concurred with the notion that it was about Mrs. Alito, right? Which is still a story. I mean, I could second guess them. We've all been in newsrooms where we've maybe made tough calls on things that in hindsight we might have regretted the decision or wish we'd done it a little bit differently. In this particular case, Marty Barron, who was the top editor at the time, didn't know about this at all. It didn't rise to his level. Surprisingly, that isn't that? Aren't you surprised uh, by that? Well, I mean, even at the but, Washington Post, that it wouldn't reach the executive editor? Well, but we're looking at through the lens of how we're seeing it now. Yeah. And so internally, they didn't think they needed to handle it. But the top editor at the time, under Barron, now says, you know, maybe I should have pushed harder for this story. It's yeah. Like, no kidding. <laughs> and like, what, were you, what were you thinking? I don't mind second guessing that now. So what makes it news now is that now it came out. I appreciate the fact that the Times now, in reporting about it, two things about the current uh, setup. First, they were very transparent about exactly who they interviewed and how and what they were told. And they gave us all the details of the neighborhood dispute. That's in the a second story of follow-up. And then explain to us how it happens that the second story came to them about the vacation home just a couple of days after the first story ran. People are contacting Jody Cantor, the reporter, saying, oh, yeah, well, this is not the only flag that the Alitos have flown. I'm pretty sure that Mrs. Alito knew that her husband was a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> and that it would be a, not the right thing to do to put up that kind of a flag. I think it's still news because we need to know where our judges are coming from. But didn't we? And this don't is, we have similar restrictions in our own lives? We journalists. I mean, my yeah. wife is very political, but she you never, put posters on your she uh, did not. front lawn. So she never put Do political put posters, in bumper her... stickers for candidates on your cars. No, no, I, I, I feel the same <laughs> way. I think Justice Roberts, John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, when he first came on as an associate justice on the court. His wife was working for a law firm that did a lot of lobbying and a lot of government work, and she resigned because she wanted to eliminate the appearance and the questions raised by her own work because she's in the same household as the justice on the court. And the reason is for people to have faith and confidence that the system is not corrupt and not biased, even an appearance of a conflict of interest can undermine that. So eliminate that. Just find another way to do it. And to me, it just seems a simple rule might be in, in the Alito household, don't fly any flags, okay? You know, let's just not even make people think that we're biased, because they will. And they do. <laughs> right. In the journalism profession, it's even the appearance of bias is something we try to avoid so strictly. I mean, I I have thought, well, what if it was a reporter? How would we feel about a reporter flying that flag outside their home if they were covering national politics? I think they'd have a problem with that. We do enforce that. I, I remember at the Times Union, a, an artist who was not engaged at all in political coverage, but he was kind of roped into standing on a stage behind a politician who was making a statement. I should say roped into it. He was there at this event, and somebody said, here, come stand behind and make this. And I actually put a disciplinary letter in his file, which is what you did in those days, and saying, you should know better. You're a journalist, even though you're not covering politics, even though you're, you know, you draw pictures with all due respect. To the <laughs> <laughs> well, can, are, are journalists allowed to make campaign contributions? You know, should they be making not contributions? No. And, and, and um, some organizations have gone through and found 
journalists who have made campaign contributions and publish that because campaign contribution records are public. And it does show that some journalists have. And I think they're overstepping their bounds. If they're going to try to be unbiased, of course, we all have our personal preferences and our personal opinions. But if they want to be presenting news as if it's unbiased, they should tell all sides and they should not put a shadow over it by having a particular political bend. So there are some people who would put a shadow over this particular coverage saying that this is overblown, the liberal media is making something out of nothing, this happened a while ago, it happened only for a short time, it was his wife, and why are we making a big deal out of it? And my response would be, it is a big deal. We need to know that our justices, even though they're going to have their own opinions, and even though I would hope that no matter what their opinions, that they can put aside their personal opinions in making their judgments on cases. But there's this big but. The fact that that was out there, I think, should be a warning to people that uh, Alito should be recusing himself. The, uh, it is Fox News, by the way, that has taken that stance that this is an overblown story, that it shouldn't be done. And, and this is, of course, Fox News that has also been <laughs> relentlessly going after the judge in the Trump case. Uh, judge Juan Mershon mm -hmm. in New York City. What an amazing yeah. thing. They're, they're saying that he's biased, he's tainted, he should recuse himself. He has a daughter who worked on a pro-democratic uh, website for a while, and therefore he's tainted. He once gave, I think, ten dollars to a Democratic candidate, or something like that, and and the might uh, have been thirty-five. Might have been thirty-five. <laughs> All right, but in Still. in any event, a judicial commission looked at that and found that he committed no wrong, and they did not think it had any merit in his ability to be objective and to run a proper court. Now they're making big hay out of that. But on the same time, they're ignoring the conflict of Alito and the conflict of the associate judge Clarence Thomas, whose wife, Ginny Thomas, was actively involved in urging the, the overthrow of the election results in 2020. You know, these, these do undermine, as a citizen, my, my faith in the Supreme Court, which is I've always argued that they'll do the right thing once they're there. I don't have that confidence anymore. And if the only way to get it back would to see these two judges step aside on cases involving these issues of the 2020 election and Trump's own arguments that he's immune from prosecution, et cetera. What about so, your confidence in the uh, integrity of journalism based upon what you see at Fox News and the New York Post, uh, you know, which coverage of the Trump trial has been quite remarkable? Well, I'll, our colleague on the Media Project, Ira Fussfeld, will often point out some journalists. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some journalists and some journalistic entities that have enormous bias and point of view and, and don't even hide it. And Fox News comes to mind <laughs> as the number one. Yeah, yeah, Fox News never fails to disappoint. And, and I think we shouldn't forget that because every once in a while I, I'll say, oh, I'm not even going to bother with Fox News. But when you see the headlines and if you continue to watch the coverage, you see that they are ginning up the opposition, the, the MAGA crowd more and more and at a, an alarming rate. And I, we have to just continue to call it out and call it for what it is, is which is a bunch of lies, misleading um, information about important issues before us as a country. And this is problematic because of the niche that Fox News fills, the niche, if you prefer. And so many people pay attention, for example, the notion that there was an FBI plot to assassinate Donald Trump based upon the language of the search warrant from Mar-a-Lago, this is outrageous. Of course, this is Trump claiming this and being amplified by Fox and other right-wing media. This is a dilemma for the, the real news media, because how much of that do you repeat and give legs to as opposed to ignore? It's dangerous to ignore, and yet... By repeating it, it plants a seed in people's exactly. minds. Exactly. I think you nailed it. It's the constant struggle when covering Trump. If you give too much attention to these bizarro theories and these statements that he makes, he's, he's also alleging this week that Joe Biden was on drugs during the State of the Union address, and he won't debate Biden unless he takes a drug test first. 
I mean, that's absurd. And, and this notion that an FBI boilerplate statement saying that if necessary, the FBI will use lethal force, you know, if they're prevented from carrying out their duties. They deliberately did their search of Mar-a-Lago for these government papers when Trump was not there. They didn't even want it to have, you know, even a confrontation. And it wouldn't have been anything like that. It's boilerplate language that's in every search warrant that the FBI carries out. And, and to portray it as Trump is portraying it is bizarre. And here we are talking about it and amplifying it. Barbara, you're right. <laughs> wow. It's, but it's <laughs> how, do, how do we get past this? I don't know, because if we're calling out Fox News, if we're calling out Donald Trump for these lies, for these misstatements, there are no ethical standards, it seems, that uh, that we can really attach anymore. You have to point to the flaws. But again, we've, we've talked about this before. This makes the real journalists who are concerned about integrity and honesty appear to be biased against Donald Trump and against the right because of of the way they're doing their job. Well, at, at the time of this taping, the jury is deliberating the Trump case, the Trump criminal case, and I'm imagining that the bigger news outlets and the AP are all, I hope, planning how are they going to cover this, what's the response going to be, what are the different angles that they're going to have to take so that it's not biased coverage, but it's insightful coverage. It explains what's going on that they're prepared for whatever might be happening as a result. But the Fox coverage, we and know what it will Fox, be. The, right. It will I'm be not a think, denunciation. I'm not talking about Fox at all. Mm-hmm. That's right. the real media. Well, I just have to say, a couple of weeks ago, you know, I'm the alumni board chair at Columbia, and I went there to speak at their graduation briefly. I'm not the featured speaker or anything. I just got to say congratulations, welcome to the alumni. But I did ad lib a little line. I said, you know, you have a lot of opportunities out there. Don't go to work for Fox, folks. <laughs> and they cheered. They cheered. It was great. It was one of my great moments. I'm very happy. Anyway, we're out of well time. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, you know, any legitimate journalist would say that. You can't work for Rupert Murdoch. That is my point of view anyway. <laughs> we are out of time for the Media Project this week. We've had Barbara Lombardo here and Judy Patrick and Mike Spain and and I'm Rex Smith. And we're grateful to our producer, David Gustina, for making this all possible and to you folks for joining us here, and we hope to come back again next week for The Media Project. Meet such interesting people Like the richest girl who could not bake a cake ding ling ding ling 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 Now newspaper men are... The Media Project is a national production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union editor and current Upstate American Substack columnist Rex Smith, Judy Patrick, Vice President for Editorial Development for the New York Press Association and former editor of the Daily Gazette, Barbara Lombardo, adjunct professor at the University at Albany and former editor of the Saratogian, and Mike Spain, former associate editor of the Times Union. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm your producer, David Gustina. Thanks for listening. Interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the show. Now, publisher...